Hello, I'm Ushma Neal, Editor-at-Large for the Journal of Clinical Investigation, and thank you for joining me today for the next in our series of Conversations with Giants in Medicine. Today, I'm happy to interview Dr. Griffin Rogers, the Director of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Dr. Rogers led studies demonstrating the effectiveness of hydroxyurea treatment for sickle cell disease. Hydroxyurea was the first FDA approved treatment for sickle cell. In the intervening years, Dr. Rogers has worked on gene therapies and other treatments for this disorder while also taking on massive administrative responsibilities within the NIH, culminating in his appointment to the directorship of the NIDDK in 2007. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Rogers. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I would love to start with hearing a little bit more about your family, uh, what you were like as a kid, and if you can properly pronounce New Orleans for me. You got it. <laughs> so New Orleans. That's it. Yes. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, and grew up there, went to school in the uh, 60s and 70s. Um, my mother was a public health nurse. My father was a high school science and, and a public health teacher. Um, and uh, as a kid, I guess I was studious. I, I wasn't very tall. Uh, and therefore, I tended to, to uh, move towards the kind of the academic sports, if you would. Um, but, but specifically, my interests you know, really focused on math and science areas that I, I did. Uh, you know, I had an affinity for. And so at an early age, I, I think kind of sealed my interest in medicine. Uh, during my um, early years in, in, in grammar school, is what we used to call it back then, not middle school, and, and, and early high school, my mother, who I mentioned as a public health nurse, or was a public health nurse, um, would uh, often have me accompany her on the weekends when she would go to people's homes um, uh, who couldn't get into the clinics during the regular week uh, to receive their vaccination and other things. And, and it was probably that period that really solidified my, my great interest in, in ultimately going in, into medicine. Um, she was, uh, uh, and, and, and in a way now that, you know, it's obviously very common as parlance health disparities, but these were very poor, impoverished neighborhoods, often housing projects that we went in. Uh, and you could clearly see, you know, the role that poverty had in the uh, uh, really making these very common uh, chronic diseases uh, much more prevalent and much more uh, serious. In reading some of the interviews you've given before, you've also spoken about three friends of yours that you had in high school who all had sickle cell disease. Now, I imagine that that must have had a massive imprint on you. Well, it really did. I, I, by the time I'd gotten to high school, I, I was clearly drawn to the area of, of medicine. But it was these three friends that I had in high school. Of course, I went to a, an all-boys school, uh, and so... These friends were all at other associated high schools throughout the, the city, three friends with sickle cell disease. Uh, and at that time, there was very little that you could do. If they were in pain, you would give them pain medicines. If their, their blood counts got too low, you would give them blood transfusions. If they had an infection, antibiotic. But there was very little that you could do in the natural. The, the life expectancy at that time was, you know, in the mid-20s. Uh, one of these uh, friends died when I was still in high school, and two others died while I was in, attending college. And so that probably did instill in me a desire to uh, learn more about the disease and, and ultimately led to my decision to go into the field of hematology and actually do biomedical research uh, in, uh, in sickle cell disease. So you had decided fairly early on both that you wanted to go to medical school and that you wanted to focus on hematology, yes? Yes, you got it. And, so, and therefore, my selection of, of colleges that I applied for uh, were really colleges in which I could potentially accelerate my movement from undergraduate to uh, 
to uh, medical school, which, which ultimately led me to select uh, just a few schools to apply to, but, but ultimately to the program at, at Brown University, because it was an accelerated program. Um, from high school, you're essentially accepted into not only the college, but into their advanced medical program at the time. And uh, um, one could obtain essentially an undergraduate, a graduate, and then later they completed the entire cycle. So both also a medical degree as well, which is, is what I did. Okay. So were you able to get any research experience during this time? I thought I remembered reading something about you studying the blood of octogenarians. That's correct. Well, you know, my first, we were all assigned um, a, a mentor, a, a professional mentor while I was there. And of course, since I was in this advanced medical program, uh, I was fortunate to, to have uh, Dr. Pierre Galetti, who was the equivalent of the dean of the medical school as my, as my mentor. And he was a very um, well-known uh, bioengineer. In fact, the American Institute for Medicine and Bioengineering uh, names their top award after him, the Pierre Galetti Award. At the time, he had developed both an artificial kidney and an artificial lung, and he actually had sort of a merger of those two that he called a clung. And I worked with him my freshman year in college, and it was my assignment to study various parameters of the blood before it went into this device and then after it came out, particularly it's built, how well it was filtering the blood and, and how well the, the lung portion was oxygenated. So that was actually my first real, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, ability or, or acquisition of some knowledge in the biomedical uh, research sphere. I continue to do that work but then later, as I mentioned, I was uh, also enrolled in a master's program uh, at Brown. And my goal was, in fact, to, to uh, team up with the, one of the chiefs of medicines at one of the affiliated hospitals, who was well known as a researcher when he was in New York in the field of sickle cell disease. But it turns out that there weren't very many African-American uh, individuals in Rhode Island or neighboring areas. And so we chose to, to work in a field of uh, red blood cell uh, metabolism among octogenarians. And there was really no shortage of, of octogenarians in, in Rhode Island at the time. That actually worked out quite well. You know, our, our goal was to determine whether the red cell, being a terminally differentiated cell, could give some clue as the overall aging process within the body, actually. That was uh, work that has now been replicated by others, but it, it gave me a, uh, the ability to kind of instill rigor and reproducibility and, and, and techniques. And so that was Dr. Herbert Lichtman, one of my uh, uh, first mentors uh, uh, at Brown that I studied under. What made you choose Wash U and that destination for the next phase of your training? Well, there are a number of, uh, of uh, attendings uh, at, uh, at Brown who were very familiar with the program at uh, Washington University, particularly the hematology program. They were very well known for internal medicine. Of course, you may be familiar with the Wash U Manual of Internal Medicine, which is one of the sort of leading cellular uh, pocket spiral uh, books. Um, but... Um, I was really looking to, to get an outstanding uh, training in the field of internal medicine and possibly staying there to continue on, you know, with a hematology uh, uh, fellowship. Uh, and at Wash U, uh, I really uh, met some very uh, talented uh, professors, some of whom you've actually interviewed <laughs> uh, on, on this series. And they really further inspired my desire to go into a research career. Excellent. So after your internship residency, chief residency, how did you end up at the NIH? And especially for someone interested in hematology, how did you end up at the NIDDK? <laughs> 
that's a frequently asked question. What is NIDDK doing in, in the field of hematology? Let me just go back a little bit to watch you to, to tell you about some of those connections. One of my, um, it turns out, a mentor and sort of role model when I was at the NIH, uh, when I was at uh, Wash U Barnes, uh, was a Dr. Jim Gavin, who worked with Dr. Jesse Roth, who I know you interviewed, and it was actually Dr. Gavin who worked in Dr. Roth's lab and was involved in the, in the identification of the uh, insulin receptor uh, early on after he received his PhD. And it was Dr. Gavin who strongly recommended that I consider uh, not only coming to the NIH, but actually working in the NID, what was the precursor of the NIDDK uh, at the time. And then when I became a senior resident at the NIH, I was chosen to be a chief resident at the affiliated uh, John Cochran VA hospital. And the chief of medicine there was a fellow named Lewis Chase, who, as it turns out, was an endocrinologist who had also worked uh, at uh, the NIDDK in the laboratory of uh, Dr. Arabak, who, and also my predecessor for this job, Dr. Alan Spiegel. So they were contemporaries. And so he also strongly encouraged me to consider a fellowship at the NIH uh, and in NIDDK. Now, I was confused as well. At the time, I said, well, if I'm interested in sickle cell disease, why would I be going to the Diabetes Institute? Well, it turns out that my mentor ultimately was a Dr. Alan Schechter. And Dr. Schechter had uh, just published uh, a two-part paper in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, on sickle cell disease, summarizing the pathophysiology as they understood it in the uh, mid to the late 70s and potential therapies that would sort of address that pathophysiologic point. And so uh, I, I came to the NIH uh, during my second year uh, as a resident in advance to apply. And the lab chief at that time was uh, uh, Dr. Chris Anthonson, who was one of the four Nobel laureates. and. Uh, so the process back then is that even if you wanted to work with an investigator in the lab, you first have to talk to and get through the lab sheet. So after about 15 minutes with speaking with Dr. Anfinson, I guess I was okay. And uh, he moved me uh, further on, but he used that opportunity to give me some advice, advice that he gave to a lot of, uh, of, of physician scientists uh, at the time. And so I was very grateful to, have that opportunity to speak with them. So that then moves me, and now you know why I'm at NIDDK, but then why hematology? And if you just give me a moment, I can give you a little bit of the history of the field of hematology in NIDDK. This year, we actually celebrate our 70th anniversary of the Institute. It was, uh, it was formed in 1950. Uh, and at the time, it was actually called the National Institute of Arthritis and metabolic diseases. And um, at the time, it was considered that red blood cell diseases, as they were known back in the 50s and early 60s, were largely metabolic in origin. There was iron deficiency anemia, there was folate deficiency, there was B12 deficiency. And so a number of, of, of uh, eminent scientists uh, who were doing basic studies to understand erythropoiesis specifically and hematopoiesis more generally were actually grantees of ours. I actually, in advance of our interview, I, I went back to look at some of the very early oral one grants that we gave out. And it turns out that they're, 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 uh, they're numbered obviously sequentially, but if you look at the DK R01002, that is a, the second R01 we've ever given out. It was to a Dr. Max Wintrow, who was a very prominent hematologist at the University of Utah. And he tried to understand the basis of some of these nutrient uh, red cell uh, de uh, deficiencies. Uh, and he was a, a long-term grantee of ours, 30 years or more. So this is how, um, we were always involved in, in 
hematology research, but it wasn't actually until 1972 uh, that Richard Nixon uh, decided to pass the Sickle Cell Disease Act. And I think he allocated some six or eight million dollars, which was a lot of money back in 1972, uh, to the NIH for the purposes of studying sickle cell anemia. And at the time, the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute was only the National Heart and Lung Institute. They decided that, well, we'll, we'll take the money and we'll actually change our name to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And so we've more or less since that time have jointly uh, done work in blood diseases with NIDDK focusing more on the basic science, whereas NHLBI is more involved in the, in the clinical space. Can you walk me through how you got involved in some of the early studies in which you engaged in at NIH in terms of the molecular genetics of hemoglobinopathies, and then what led you up to um, leading the clinical trials on hydroxyurea? Mm -hmm. So my um, mentor, again at the time when I came to work with Dr. Alan Schechter and colleagues Connie Noguchi and others, had been working on uh, this, this concept that in sickle cell disease, it's not the sickling of the cell per se, but it's the biophysical uh, state of the hemoglobin inside the cell that dictates the pathophysiology. Uh, unlike normal blood, normal hemoglobin, that as you know, reversibly binds oxygen and carbon dioxide, uh, normal hemoglobin either oxygenated or deoxygenated, continues to be soluble in solution inside cells, but also in free solution. Whereas because of the mutation in sickle cell disease, when the hemoglobin tetramers give up its oxygen, they uh, undergo this uh, physical uh, structural change in their three-dimensional ge geometry, and they become sticky in a way they actually form polymer with adjacent hemoglobin molecules. And ultimately, this, this, these uh, strands form large polymer inside the cell, uh, which if the cell is able to get back to the lungs and get reoxygenated, the polymer melts away, but some of the polymer remains inside the cells, making them difficult to become deformable, which they have to once they get into the small capillaries. And it was Dr. Schechter and, and Gucci's view, as well as others, that if you could somehow inhibit this fundamental polymerization process, irrespective of whether the cells look sickle or not, you could restore the rheology, the normal rheology of the cell. Uh, what we, so that was one piece of information. The second piece of information, as we've learned clinically, that young children did not uh, display their first symptoms of sickle cell disease until they're six to nine months uh, of age. And that is because there is sort of a second type of hemoglobin that predominates during the second and third trimester in utero, so-called fetal hemoglobin. Based upon these structural studies, we know that the fetal hemoglobin molecule can interact with the polymer and melt it away. Uh, and in fact, in, in uh, studies around the world, uh, in populations that had a persistently high level of fetal hemoglobin, which was inherited in conjunction with sickle cell disease, these populations tend to have mild, most inconsequential disease. In fact, a, a, a fact that most people sort of learn is that sickle cell disease is a disease of Africans and their descendants. But actually, the place in the world where there are the largest number of people with sickle cell disease is actually in India. Um, uh, and that's because the disease in general tends to be milder. India and the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, which was something that we learned when uh, uh, Dr. Y.W. Khan developed the concept of RFLP. Uh, and haplotypes, and, and he was able to discern from that, which is really the basis of genome-wide association studies, but 
but more relevant to sickle cell disease, it really, uh, you could understand where in the world the mutation arose. And this area in India and Saudi Arabia, again, with a high fetal hemoglobin, led to the belief that along with the studies in, you know, in infants and, and, and children, that if you could somehow stimulate fetal hemoglobin production to a certain degree to replicate what you see in those populations, that one had the possibility of, of greatly ameliorating the clinical disease. But that was sort of the second fact. Then the third fact was that individuals, and actually I think at your current institution, a lot of this work went on, using the drug hydroxyurea to treat patients that had other types of myeloproliferative diseases like chronic myelogenous leukemia and polycythemia vera. Uh, most of them show a small, albeit significant, rise in their fetal hemoglobin levels compared to once the drug was initiated. And so, in short, that's what led us to develop this clinical study at the, uh, at the NIH Clinical Center, hospitalizing patients for about three months to follow very carefully the effects of uh, treatment with hydroxyurea. They were hospitalized for this period of time because we wanted to determine what is the most effective dose, and we could rule out the uh, drug non-compliance as a variable because they were there, we saw that they got the drug, we could actually measure area on the curve and distribution and things of that nature. And so that led to the, the, the first dozen or so patients that were treated. It's about a 70% response rate. And then subsequently we studied other patients and achieved a, a very similar result. I have to say, and it would, again, I'm going <laughs> on for too long, uh, but the, the thing that I think um, really greatly expanded the knowledge of this finding uh, was the before he was a New York Times uh, bestseller, a bestselling author of books like The Tipping Point and Outliers and things like that. Malcolm Gladwell was actually a beat science writer for the Washington Post. And he interviewed me after our paper came out uh, in the New England Journal. Uh, and that got a lot of coverage and ultimately led to other study, other centers replicating these findings and ultimately to the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute doing the definitive, funding the definitive uh, clinical trial in this, in, this, uh, in this area. The power of the popular press, right? <laughs> That's right. You got it. On the connection between sickle cell disease with something that you don't think about. In 1922, there was a Dr. Vern Mason, who was an intern at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and he actually described the very first patient at Hopkins who was, um, who was recognized uh, as having sickle cell anemia. First paper was you know, published in 1910, but in 22, he published this paper, and he was actually the first person to... Um, to coin the term sickle cell anemia, uh, characterizing both features of the disease, the sickle cells under a microscope, as well as the profound anemia. And, it, and he was a single author on a JAMA paper. And as far as I can tell, I don't think he published anything else. But after leaving Hopkins, he went out to Los Angeles to become a fairly uh, famous internal medicine physician and actually became a physician to many movie stars and other luminaries including Howard Hughes. And as you probably know, Howard Hughes was somewhat reclusive and didn't confide in very many people except for his internist. And as he was getting closer to the time that, you know, he knew he didn't have many years left, he asked Vern Mason, you know, what should I do with this fortune that I have amassed? And Vern Mason says, well, maybe you should set up an institute, a medical institute for uh, biomedical research, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And so he followed up with that. So there's a sickle cell Howard Hughes connection. What was that time like for you as you were transitioning from being a fellow at the NIH to starting your own lab, um, you know, shifting from clinical research 
to full-time research, also running the molecular and clinical hematology branch within the NIDDK. Um, talk to me a little bit about what it was like establishing your first lab. Well, I, I think it was very exciting. I mean, people say that, you know, you first start a project, and if that project is successful, it turns into a program. And the key to the success of that program uh, really rests upon the the direction that you go in and in the people that you're able to recruit into your program. And I think I was successful uh, in, in both. I was able to move the, the program of developing successful therapies for people with sickle cell disease. And, and that ultimately led to its replication in other sites, eventually with the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute funding a, a large uh, randomized controlled trial which uh, ultimately led to the, the drug being the first FDA-approved drug in adults. Subsequently, additional studies led to its extension of the drug uh, in children and, and adolescents. Uh, so that, that, that was, you know, uh, very uh, uh, promising. And, and again, I, I really appreciate all the colleagues that work with me on the project. But then the second set is turning that project into a program. That ultimately led me to uh, recruit others into the field. Uh, a very uh, talented uh, clinical care fellow who's now the chief of medicine at Pittsburgh. And I got him interested in uh, uh, the concept of, of pulmonary hypertension and sickle cell disease, which is an area that uh, we saw was you know, quite troubling. And, and then uh, my first tenure track recruitment into my branch, Dr. John Tisdale, who sort of has led the way now with both transplantation uh, as well as more recently gene therapy. And again, both of those uh, programs uh, uh, have been uh, successful. Bringing up your transition to deputy director, you then moved to acting head of the NIDDK and then in 2007, the actual director of the NIDDK. But why have you stayed this long? Um, why? Um, you know, what were your keys to success? How have you increased your budget massively? What has it been like testifying before Congress and being the face of the Institute? Well, you know, um, these types of positions uh, come up very rarely. I think one has to sort of prepare themselves for it. You know, it is said that, for example, a physician in the course of their career might affect the lives of a few thousand patients by seeing them, you know, in their office or in their clinic. If you're a teacher of medicine, um, it has a multiplying effect because of the, the hundreds in each class over, you know, 25 year career, you could potentially affect indirectly the lives of 100,000 uh, of patients. But you know, if you're a researcher or an administrator of that research, the conduct and the support for the research, you potentially have a mark on millions, perhaps tens of millions of people uh, worldwide. And so it really is truly a, a transformative effect that, that one can have. And so you really can't turn that type of, uh, of, of opportunity uh, down. I've been very pleased to, to be at the NIDDK for these many years, both initially as a fellow, then ultimately as an administrator. Because by the way, you don't, you aren't able, you don't need, need to necessarily give up anything. I still see patients uh, occasionally. I run a research laboratory and, and then, you know, and, and I also, you know, have a, a chance to, to support and, and conduct research on what I think are some of the nation's most common and chronic and costly and consequential diseases. And that's really uh, what keeps me going and, and keeps me exciting. At last count, we had about 68 or 70 different professional societies or um, patient advocacy groups that have an interest in the kinds of diseases uh, that we are responsible for. And having a chance to talk with them, you know, about their wishes and desires and concerns uh, and, and sort of formulating a plan to make sure that, that uh, everyone sees that what you're doing is moving the sort of the needle forward in terms of their particular diseases or interests gives me great joy. 
and having the opportunity to speak with both patients and providers as well as policy makers uh, to affect you know, the bottom line, the budget uh, to, to move that support for research forward uh, is, is quite gratifying. So every day is a different, you know, it's a different opportunity. And that's something that really jazzes me. Well, it's clear that one of the other things that has always jazzed you is education, because in addition to your MD, you hold an MBA from Hopkins as well as a law degree. So what is behind this continual passion for education and how have these extra degrees helped you as an IDDK director? Sure. Well, you know, as I frequently say at, at many commencement addresses, you really have to be a lifelong learner. And I don't like to just give that lip service. I'm kind of a, you know, a, a, a testament to that, you know, because I feel that um, just in the field of, 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 of medicine and science, for example, things are changing so rapidly that the half-life of knowledge, you know, is maybe four or five years, 10 years, a lot of the concepts that we are taught are either greatly, you know, uh, modified or completely shown not to be true. So it really is the world of the lifelong learner uh, that will sort of live in a world that doesn't currently exist now. If you think about it for a moment, you know, for our current um, medical classes, we're sort of, uh, many of them, once they go into practice, will be going into specialties and subspecialties that don't exist now to treat diseases and using technology that doesn't, also doesn't exist to tackle problems that we aren't quite aware of yet. Just look at COVID-19. Imagine all the things that are needed for us to kind of think about bending the curve and going back to some degree of normality. And I think over time, these kinds of, you know, not only uh, clear and present dangers, but more chronic uh, diseases will have to be confronted. And so, yeah, again, the need for lifelong learning. In my particular case, I found that, you know, uh, in terms of the MBA, the general leadership skills and the familiarity with things like accounting, finance, and, and economics uh, were really uh, instrumental. And, and sort of at the end of the day, it, it leaves you with a better understanding of concepts like marginal value and opportunity cost and, and the uh, unintended consequences, for example. With respect to the legal uh, degree, a lot of what we do, particularly with industry and, and the private sector, revolves around intellectual property and, um, uh, and, and you know, advancing technology. Uh, but of course, obviously, employment law and, and negotiations are other skills that one could hone. So I, I find those not only generally satisfying, but specifically important for the job that, that I'm involved in. The last question I always ask of everyone I interview is about what other profession you could have possibly pursued that would have kept you this dedicated. Now it's clear that you could, you have the education to have a career in business and finance and law, but if you couldn't be a scientist or a clinician, what do you think could have kept you wrapped this whole time? That's a tough one. You know, I would say that, um, uh, I really trained to do what I'm doing now. I enjoy this so much that it's, I'd be hard pressed to give you a, a second alternative. I think, you know, fundamentally, uh, people that, you know, are interested in math and science um, are almost by definition educators. And so I guess if there was an alternative path that I would have taken, it would have been in you know, in, in math or, or science uh, education. But, but truly, I would, you know, it said when you're doing what you truly love and you actually get paid for it, you, you can't ask for anything better. So I, I think I've, I'm doing now what, it, what I've always been uh, was sort of raised to do. Fantastic. Dr. Rogers, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a real pleasure to hear more about your life and your motivations. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for a great interview. Thank you.